Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to day two of the virtual festival, AstroFest, South Africa's first digital astronomy festival, or as I more commonly like to call it, AstroFest, the lockdown edition. This program is jointly presented by the South African Astronomical Observatory and SciFest Africa. Well known for hosting the largest science festival in the country, SciFest have embarked on a quite an ambitious project uh, to hold a science festival digitally uh, for six months, ending in March 2021. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Pran Govinda, representing the South African Astronomical Observatory, an entity of the National Research Foundation. We've had fantastic interactions yesterday, from workshops that you can do at home with your kids, to speaking on subjects like planetary imaging and observations. We ended the evening on quite a high note, and we ended uh, taking us all on a journey on the Artemis mission with NASA. In today's edition, we explored the cosmos, a branch of astronomy concerned with the studies of the origin and evolution of the universe. And we take it a step further, and we start to explore artificial intelligence. I would like to welcome a very, very good colleague of mine, Professor Bruce Bassett, a senior researcher um, is the head of cosmology group at Ames South Africa. Bruce is a graduate of the University of Cape Town, where he obtained his MSc in Applied Mathematics after completing a PhD in Triester, a postdoctoral fellowship in Oxford. He lectured at the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation at Portsmouth University. After a sabbatical in Kyoto University, he returned to Cape Town. Welcome back, Bruce. Bruce has now entered um, a joint position at the University of Cape Town uh, as a professor of applied mathematics and as an astronomer at the South African Astronomical Observatory. His research focuses on observational cosmology, interference and machine learning, uh, particularly applied to large cosmological surveys through observations with our very own Southern African Large Telescope or SALTS Welcome to the virtual festival, Bruce, and over to you. Thanks so much, Pran. Great to be here. I'm just going to share my screen and we can get going. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, please do feel free to just drop questions in the Q&A. Um, I guess Pran will pick them up and I will try to keep it to about 15 minutes to allow lots of time for questions. Um, so, yes, I gave this title, The Future of Cosmology and Natural Science, which is, which is very ambitious, but I, I would love to cover some of my thoughts, at least, on what, what the future of cosmology and natural science is. Maybe it's a good place to start, though, is to ask, you know, wh wh what is natural science and cosmology and why do we do it? And I think there are many different answers, and I think those are important to understand. Uh, in terms of trying to predict the future. I think one of the big reasons, of course, we do science is to get perspective. This is the famous Voyager one shot taken 30 years ago, uh, the pale do a blue dot showing Earth taken from you know, the outer regions of our own solar system. I think science like this does help us understand our place in the universe. The other big reason we do science, of course, is to understand mysteries. You know, you can't go very far in the world before you hit your, uh, a mystery. Here's one uh, mystery. The universe is made up mostly of stuff that we don't know at all. Um, so this is actually a picture of my keyboard, an old keyboard of mine that I mod modified. It sort of represents our understanding of the content of the universe. 95% of the universe is made up of stuff that we do not know what it is. So it's a bit like having a keyboard where only two of the keys uh, have anything on them, all the rest are dark. So we know that most of the universe is made up of dark matter and dark energy, and we don't understand what those are. And so that, that question, that, that, that mystery is a wonderful driving force for science. Another similar one is the discovery of the expansion of the universe. The universe is getting bigger and bigger over time. And that's not due to global warming, as someone once suggested to me. The whole universe is getting bigger. Everything is getting further apart. But not only that, we've, we've known that for nearly for around 100 years. 
20 years ago, we discovered that the universe is actually accelerating. So it's almost as if someone's stepping on the accelerator uh, pedal for the, for the universe. Why is that? We don't know. That's effectively a kind of anti-gravity. It's a beautiful example of the kind of mysteries that drive science. Uh, you can go the other way. You can ask, well, what happens if we run time backwards? Then the universe is getting smaller and smaller. And then Einstein's theory of relativity predicts that the universe actually would end up in a single point, which is what we call the Big Bang. And that single point is exactly the same uh, thing that happens with black holes. And black holes, as you may know, was the, you know, Roger Penrose was awarded half of the no this year's Nobel Prize in physics for proving that you cannot get away from these um, points, infinitely small points of infinite density in black holes and, and the Big Bang. Of course, that asks the question, well, where did the universe come from? Or what happens if you were in a black hole at the singularity? We don't know the answer to that, but th those are another beautiful example of the mysteries that drive a lot of science. I think on a personal level, I think a lot of scientists are also motivated by solving hard problems. They might not be mysterious, but they're hard. So much of life is about finding the obvious solution, which I like this example of find X, here it is. You know, scientists are often driven by the, the joy of solving hard problems. And indeed, I think I love this quote by Jacob Bronowski, the most remarkable discovery ever made by scientists was science itself. The process of discovery is actually arguably the most important thing uh, science has ever done. And one of the reasons is that this discovery leads to all sorts of practical inventions. So people sometimes, I, I know of people who argue that fundamental research is of no real value, but lasers, for example, discovered in the 60s, I think it was described as a solution without a problem. Uh, it took a long time, 20 years before uh, useful solutions were found, but now lasers are everywhere. Um, perhaps an even longer time was uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. The special th theory was developed in 1905. And one of the big ideas in special relativity is that uh, space and time are fused together into a four dimensional object three dimensions for space and one for time. And we shouldn't think of those as separate. But when you have your four dimensional loaf of bread, as it was, you can slice that up in many different ways. And each slice gives you a, a slice of space. And then time, as you slice along the loaf of bread, it, it, so time is the, is the dimension along which you, um, you get the different slices of bread. Now, so, from that point of view, space and time are not absolute, but they're flexible, just as in the way you can slice up a loaf of bread in many different ways. And this is very, very practical implications. GPS satellites, which we all use uh, to navigate, rely critically on Einstein's theory of relativity. And one way to understand that is to be able to be accurate, to be useful, a GPS satellite needs to tell the time to a billionth of a second accuracy. But special relativity and his more general theory of relativity, Einstein's theories, cause seven to 45,000 nanoseconds of change of time um, every day. So you have to have a deep understanding of gravity to be able to use GPS. But that took, well, roughly 100 years to go from being pure theory to being practical use. So I think it's um, it's good to understand the different motivations for doing science when, when we want to think about the future. Well, let's move on to artificial intelligence because that's really the thrust of what I'd like to talk about. How is artificial intelligence going to impact uh, science? And it could impact any of the, the ways, the things that we've been talking about. Well, um, what is artificial intelligence? It's essentially trying to get machines to be intelligent. The artificial corresponds to or um, really relates to the fact that it's non-human, non-biological, at least at the moment. Um, perhaps one of the first successes uh, was IBM's um, Watson beating um, champions at the game show Jeopardy. 
Um, I like this because down here, one of the participants had written, I for one welcome our new computer overlords. <laughs> so that was, um, that was quite a long time ago already. And it's fundamentally driven, the AI revolution is driven by what's, what's known as Moore's law, the fact that computing power, storage, disk space has been growing exponentially for a long time. Here's an example of an advert for 15 megabyte hard drive, two and a half thousand dollars. Yeah, those were the days. Um, now we're obviously up around 10 terabyte hard drives in a relatively short amount of time. AI can do all sorts of amazing things. Here's an example where they asked somebody to watch a video. They took fMRI, functional arm, M, uh, MRI images of the person's brain, and just from that alone, tried to reconstruct what the person was looking at. And you can see that it's very low resolution, but it's clearly a human. It's not perfect, of course, and you know, artificial intelligence and its biases have been a lot in the, uh, in the press. Here's an example of the AI getting things very wrong. But that was 2011. By 2016, there had been significant uh, improvements. So this is really the computer trying to read a person's mind just by looking at the brain activity. So in 20 years time, it may well be possible to show somebody what you're thinking of. Um, obviously, we can already do it to a certain extent, except you need a big fMRI machine, which is not exactly portable. AI can do all sorts of other things as well. We can give it a picture like the one on the left and ask it to write a caption. And so it says here, yeah, a woman is throwing a Frisbee in a park. And we can ask the computer, what were you looking at when you wrote this caption? And we can get an idea here. It was looking at the Frisbee and a little bit at the hand. And so it decides that there's a link between the woman and the Frisbee. So AI is really beginning to understand what it's looking at at some level. Uh, we can get computer uh, AI to play computer games. This is Dota, a very popular um, um, person versus person computer game. Um, Open AI last year reached essentially, you know, as good as any humans um, in the game of Dota. And interestingly, it used um, 100,000 computers, uh, CPU cores, and had a, about the same computing power as a bumblebee. So quite impressive if you think about it, it's able to beat humans with a brain of a bumblebee, essentially. Of course, to do that, it had to play for thousands and thousands of years effectively. Uh, so perhaps that isn't so impressive, but gives us an idea. It's able to uh, make art in a way. Uh, one of these two uh, images, and I can never remember which one is uh, created by a human, the other is created by a computer, and you, you might like to try and guess which one is made by the human, which one by the computer. So what we see is that computers uh, and artificial intelligence starting to really creep into areas that traditionally we would say would be the, the realm of human creativity. And so the natural question becomes, well, how will this impact science? How will, what impact will this have on the future of science? Before we get there, it's probably worth talking about uh, the more practical impacts. There are a lot of reports that AI could take a significant number of jobs in the next two to three decades. How many depends on who you speak to. And of course, it depends on how fast can, uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, continues to grow. But I, I think there's one, one very interesting point about this. Humans are actually very flawed. So in this plot here uh, in the foreground is a plot of the probability of a favorable uh, parole decision. So this is from the Israeli High Court justice system from a thousand parole cases. Um, for I think eight judges with about 20 years of experience each. So this is really the best of the best. And you can see that the probability of parole varies from somewhere around 70% all the way down to zero. So it's a massive effect. Whatever is on the x-axis here is massively important. And so you can ask, well, what, what is that that's being so important? And you know, if we were live and... Uh, in the same room, I'd ask the audience uh, for their suggestions, but instead I'll just tell you, these dotted lines are lunch and tea breaks. 
So you can see just before lunch, your probability of getting parole if you're in that system is basically zero. Straight after lunch, you're back to 65% and then it rapidly drops again. So this isn't that the judge and the judges, of course, are probably not aware that they have this tendency to be very, very unfair. Computers in principle have the possibility of, of not having this bias, of not being driven by our very, very human biases. But of course, we have to be very intentional about how we do it. Okay, so that um, is an introduction to science and introduction to AI. So how will AI and science come together? Well, if we look at something like the SKA, this is an artist impression of what the crew might look like in, in 10 years, perhaps around Carnarvon, hundreds, thousands of dishes, and producing perhaps an exabyte of data a day. So an exabyte is a thousand petabytes, a petabyte is a thousand terabytes. So to put that in perspective, you can sort of do an estimate of how much, how much uh, information was produced by the whole of humanity before the year 2000. And, and rough estimates are around 10 exabytes. So the SKA will produce roughly the amount of uh, all of the history, historical information of humanity before the year 2000, once every week or so, every couple of weeks. So the amount of data will be huge. So we, we will be drowning in data. And so of course we will need computers to help us search through that. In terms of how science and particularly things like astronomy will change, in the old days, astronomers would actually be at the telescope. They would often climb up and go and sit high above the ground with a thermos flask of coffee and spend the night observing, taking notes, etc. Now, we don't do that. Observers typically sit in a control room, which may not even be in the same country as the telescope uh, at the observatory. We are now building systems that would allow for remote observing from essentially anywhere in the world. And this uh, facilitates, of course, computers getting involved in the control of the telescope. So, um, so now we we realize we've got we're going to get this insane amount of data. We need a computer to look at it because humans will never be able to look at this data. Already, most as in, a, in most science, big science, humans don't look at most of the data. But it's only going to get worse. So of course the exciting opportunity and challenge is that in the data, there might be something really amazing, some diamond just sitting there, right, almost right in front of you, but you don't know it's there. And that's, I think, one of the places where AI can really uh, make a big difference is to, to kind of comb through and find it. It's, it's still challenging. Uh, so I think that'll be a very big thing. But, but beyond that, beyond just helping us deal with this, big data with the data deluge and finding rare objects. Of course, what we really want is to for the algorithms to help us understand the universe, to solve mysteries. And when you when you start thinking about that, you immediately, at least I am forced to consider the question, well, what does it mean to understand? You know, if I want to know whether a computer understands what, what it's talking about or understands something, how, I have to ask myself, how do I know if I understand something? So I ask the question to you, how do you know, what do you mean when you tell someone, yes, I understand? What does that mean? And I think that's, that's a very interesting question. So, I mean, in a sense, finally, I think the challenge will be to get AI that can really contribute to human knowledge um, and our understanding of the universe. And, and I'm reminded of this great quote, knowledge is knowing that the tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. And so I think that will definitely more and more become the realm of trying to apply AI to science is exactly in, in this, trying to extract wisdom from this avalanche of data. So I think I'll stop there and take questions if there are any. Thank you for that, Bruce. Uh, that was actually a really fantastic presentation. 
I mean, it sort of opens up your mind to how the future is most definitely going to change. Um, you know, when you had this slide up about find X, I thought you got a copy of my mathematics paper at school <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> you were, you know, showing it up here. So some of the questions that I think have come through is within astronomy, what kinds of, what are we looking to hope for? What, are, what exactly are we expecting with the integration of AI into cosmology? What are the kinds of advancements that we're going to be seeing coming? And as scientists, what are we actually uh, waiting to see? What, what do we theorize that's going to come through um, mixing the two? Well, I think, uh, you know, this slide is a little bit, obviously it's, uh, it's facetious, but I think that is a very interesting possibility. Uh, finding new, new types of objects that we've never seen before. I think that is gonna be, uh, is exciting, you know, and but the, and you know the most extreme version is that is uh, is finding artificial uh, not artificial like other life you know SETI the search for extraterrestrials it could be that in all the data that we're collecting that there are actually intelligent signals from from intelligent species and it's a fascinating thing how would you search for perhaps a signal that somebody another civilization has sent to us they may be completely different. And so how, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to think of a very general way to search for that. So that would be one example, looking for the diamonds um, hidden amongst the data. Beyond that, I think, uh, you know, the mysteries that I mentioned, for example, you know, um, dark matter, let's go back to this, this slide, for example, what is the universe made of? So we hypothesize that it could be this thing called dark matter, dark energy. Other people suggest, well, maybe Einstein's theory of relativity is not quite right, that it should be slightly different. But we haven't found a way to make that idea work. So, you know, it may be that in 20 or 30 years, AI could be able to suggest, well, maybe it's like this. So actually provide new theories we can then go and check. So I think that would be the most uh, the most exciting, um, but obviously the hardest to achieve. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. So we have a few questions from some of our attendees. Uh, Camille, hi, Camille. Welcome back. So as a hypothetical question, uh, do you see a use for AI in helping to alleviate poaching? If so, how would you envisage envis such a system? Yes, well, I, you know, it's not my field, so I, uh, you know, I can only just give you very uh, vague things. I know that people have been looking at equipping drones with AI so that the drones can fly over, um, fly over game parks to either look for poachers or just to monitor the area around uh, species that are, you know, an specific animals. And their AI could be uh, looking for poachers in and, in and amongst the trees. It could be uh, finding the most efficient route to patrol an area to self-manage. And then, for example, take the drone back to be refueled or recharged. So I think that is actually a very a good example where it can be used almost immediately. Um, I know, I'm sure that there are lot, lots of governments around the world that are not only doing that, but they're starting to weaponize the AI as well. So, you know, you could imagine a drone that has an AI that has weapons attached to it. And you can then decide, well, maybe the AI gets to make a decision about when to shoot. Because of course the poachers will soon learn that the drones um, cause trouble and will start to try and shoot them down. So you might be tempted to give the drones an ability to defend themselves. So, you know, that's that's potentially one of the dark sides of, of AI, you yeah, know, the path Def to Terminator. Definitely. And, and then how do we, um, as individuals, sort of protect ourselves from, uh, and I quote this, going to the dark side? Uh, so, so how do we keep ourselves from exploring? Because I mean, anything can be weaponized. Any system can be used for mass destruction. How do we, as scientists, as researchers, um, because we know that while we're doing fundamental research that benefits society, that delve into 
what the cosmos can offer us and what's out there. Uh, these things can also be used in various ways mm -hmm. by different people. How do we develop systems or do you think we are at a position to be advancing at the rate in which we are right now? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, historically, I think it takes, you know, it takes quite a long time for the ethical implications of a new technology to be worked out and for society to figure out, actually, no, that's not okay. We need to, you know, nuclear weapons, for example. So the problem with AI is because it's improving so fast and it's accelerating, you know, the time between when it's released and when it can do damage is, is decreasing rapidly. And so I think it's really important for the general public to get engaged and, and take an interest and ask hard questions because, you know, history shows us that scientists tend to be, you know, science is wonderful, of course, but it tends, scientists tend to be focused on solving these hard problems. So, oh, can I build an AI that's really intelligent? And that's a challenge. And then of course, once you do it, then it's like, oh, wow, maybe I shouldn't have done that. So I think it's very important that society now has to be very proactive in asking questions. Um, and we see it with social media, you know, the impact of social media, you know, AI is going to affect every aspect of our life. And so uh, society has to be very vigilant about uh, looking at the potential for abuse, for unexpected consequences. You know, we see that the suicide rate among teenagers has, uh, you know, in some places has doubled in the last 10 years. You know, is that due to social media? Is it due to automated algorithms that feed people? You know, we don't know. Often it's very hard to find out. But so it's critical that people get engaged. And it's almost the, the interaction, the, the arguments, the, the figuring stuff out that's the critical part because um, we don't have the answers. And I think society as a whole is going to go through this, this very disruptive phase in the next 20 to 30 years of trying to learn to coexist with AI. You know, I think Bruce, when we, you know, in conversations with one another, we always, um, you know, with all our colleagues or we're just talking about AI, it comes back to it's all in the algorithms. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's all sitting in there. So another question from Camille, um, he says, thanks Prof Bruce for sharing. So far, it's all amazing stuff. Is Moore's law still valid for computing power in disk space, or is the growth rate slowing down? Yeah, so I, you know, uh, I should also say this is uh, this is not this is not my field, but I think generally one can say for sure that Moore's law has been slowing down over the last few years. But I noticed that um, there's been a, a recent breakthrough from Canada, which allows the construction of five nanometer chips. So, you know. That's incredible because that's actually what's been driving Moore's law is the fact that we've been able to reduce the size of computer chips. And so five nanometers is really getting down to the atomic scale, right, of almost to a handful of atoms. So I think that will push Moore's law a little bit further. Actually, ironically, for AI, Moore's law has been a little bit irrelevant in the last five years because uh, deep learning, which is the backbone of the current way we do AI, uses uh, GPUs instead of CPUs. So CPUs are the typical PC computing. Mm -hmm. GPUs are typically what you would have in your graphics card if you wanted to, um, if you want to run high-end graphics. And GPU speeds have grown much, much faster than Moore's law. I think computing power has been doubling every three months, uh, I think, instead of every two years or 18 months, which Moore's law predicts. So actually for AI, Moore's law has been irrelevant because the corresponding Moore's law for GPUs has been much, much quicker. So, you know, I think that's another big question. If GPU compute continues to scale like it has been, well, then we'll get another fact of a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand in the next few years which which you know will really unleash um enormous ai capabilities so in its use in scientific research ai say that it's used for interpretation of observational data how do you control the ai to remain objective in analyzing mm -hmm. the data 
do you give it an end goal or some sort of open-ended reasoning capability? Yeah, so that's, a, you know, that's a great question. One, one simple answer, for example, let's imagine that we were all in charge of the AI that decides what you see on your Facebook feed, right? Okay, so we need to design an algorithm that chooses what each one of us sees. So the way that's done is by essentially writing down a function, so some sort of function, which scores all the different possible stories. So you can imagine of all the stories that your friends share and that the groups that you have share, there might be 10 times too many stories to show you on your wall. And so we need to, uh, the algorithm needs to score them and rank them for what it thinks you will be interested in. And so that is a human choice. That score function is a human choice typically. And you, you know, you might, uh, I imagine Facebook wants to maximize advertising revenue. So it might say, okay, we want to show you stuff that um, keeps you engaged and on Facebook for as long as possible every day. Okay. So there's a choice. There's a human choice there. And the algorithm just does what it's told, right? And so similarly with science in terms of being unbiased, the, the astronomer or the scientists have to choose something that gets the, uh, gets the behavior that they want. So uh, you, you might, um, and so making sure that that's unbiased is something that the scientists have to think about. So for example, I gave this example of the Israeli High Court justice uh, decisions here in this graph uh, in the, the foreground. What you could do is you could go and make uh, make sure that the algorithm, you could check whether the algorithm over its decisions exhibits any biases like that. And so you can put in checks and balances. And actually, it's much easier to put in the checks and balances for computers than it is for humans. So, for example, recently, Twitter had a problem with uh, its algorithm that cropped images was found to be, I can't remember, it's racist or sexist or both. And the way people found that is that they can just try hundreds and hundreds of images and see what happens. With a human, it's much harder to, to do that, right? If that was being done by a single human at Twitter or by 10,000 people at Twitter, you might suspect that some of them are racist or sexist, but how would you find that? It would be very difficult to find it. So actually, although the algorithms may by default be quite, uh, may have biases, it's actually, if you're systematic, it's actually easier to find it than it is with humans. So, you know, when we're speaking about um, trying to understand the integrity, um, would you say that we still have much more work we need to do with regards to analysis of the integrity? Mm. I think so, because I, I think part of the problem is with humans, you know, if we come across somebody who's biased, we could argue with them, we can fight with them, we might try to, if it's very serious, we might try and get them fired, we might, you know, we might even try to change them. But we all know that humans are not very good at change. Uh, you know, the old sayings about, you know, you can't uh, uh, teach an old dog new tricks, etc. So in a sense, as humans, we, we accept that we're all quite flawed and we've got issues. We might fight, but then people form political parties and they form interest groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we are not that adept at, at change, I would say, as humans but in many ways. So when we come to algorithms where suddenly we actually can address the bias and integrity of algorithms, we are not that, you know, it's quite a new field. So I think that there will be quite a lot of development in, in this field of how do we test whether algorithms have got good integrity, whether they are biased. Um, I think it's definitely a new field. And it, it's definitely lagging behind the development of the AI itself. Because, you know, let's, let's go back to the example of the poaching. We, uh, someone comes to us and says, okay, um, I'd like uh, you all to build me a drone that can search for poachers. 
So we build a drone and we, we train it to, to detect poachers, right? And we test it out and it seems to work great. And then we deliver it to the client and we get paid and we're like, okay, job done, right? But did we check whether the, the algorithm is racist? Did we check that it's biased? No, probably we didn't think about that, right? We, we just checked, did it detect poachers? But did we check whether, you know, when we tested it, who did we use as our test poachers? You know, we dressed people up in a certain way, right? Well, actually, you know what? There's probably a chance that we didn't think about race there or that we made some assumptions about who the poachers would be. And that's an example of how um, bias can slip into your algorithms. And uh, it, it happens all over the all over the place. And sometimes it's very hard to avoid that, right? It, and sometimes it's very subtle, right? Um, because there, it can be linked to all sorts of socioeconomic conditions, right? That uh, the reality of, of the world is driven by these complex historical, you know, inequalities, et cetera, that, you know, the algorithm will just learn. It will just look at the world and say, oh, that's the way the world is. I'll learn it that way. And so fixing that is a very subtle and it's got lots of ethical and philosophical subtleties. It's not, it's not in any way uh, cut and dried. So yeah, I think this is gonna be an increasingly important field of research, the field of uh, AI ethics. And, and the thing is, you know, human beings are flawed. And, and what we tend to do is we're now building um, AI and we're going into this process being flawed ourselves. And that will then lead me to the next question coming up from Jacqueline Stevens. Um, are there any international laws in place that restrict AI? Uh, like if people started using it to say as a poacher find the rhinos or in military use. And uh, the thing is, you know, from, from my end, we, I, I, there will come a day perhaps where our police forces will actually have a, a unit called the artificial intelligence unit that is now taking up these things. And, and this is where we're going. So Bruce, can you provide more information on this? Sure, absolutely. I mean, there is, a, I don't think it's, it's passed into law, but there's definitely an international movement to ban autonomous weapons internationally um, because once you get drones this size, with an AI camera on board, you could have thousands of them just roaming around doing facial recognition and targeting individuals, right? Assassinations. And even if you capture that drone, you might have no idea who sent it. So there is a movement, it's not in law as far as I know. Um, police, uh, some police departments are using AI to predict where crime will happen. So it's almost like minority report. And certain cities, I think San Francisco is one of them, have banned the use of facial recognition in the city by police and by others uh, exactly for this. China, I think, is probably one of the leading um, users of AI for security purposes. A very large number of cameras with um, AI running facial recognition, huge databases. I heard of a story where uh, a wanted a person um, was found in a football stadium. So out of, you know, 40,000 people, the AI picked out the, the one person. That's how powerful their systems were. Um, in terms of laws, I think Europe may be the most progressive in terms of this. So the GDPR Act, um, Data Act, and Related Acts are pushing for things like a human should be, uh, you know, the AI must be able to give a reason for its decision. So if you were denied surgery or if you were denied an insurance policy, there has to be a reason. It can't just be like, well, the algorithm said you couldn't get insurance, for example. Um, and under GDPR, there are, uh, you know, there's a strong requirement that AI gets used in a way that's really ethical and important. So for example, in Sweden, some a school was using a uh, facial recognition to do attendance registers at the school 
to save the teacher from going, you know, John, are you here and doing it that it would just do it automatically. And they were actually fined a, a significant amount of money because the, the courts ruled that that wasn't a justifiable use of AI given the privacy uh, impact of having uh, facial recognition systems. So I think Europe is probably leading, leading the way, the rest of the world is probably somewhat behind. But I suspect that we will get, uh, get more protection um, for what it's worth, you know. So I have a, I have a, thank you for that. Actually, that was quite a comprehensive answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 what, I, what I can tell is you've re really done a lot of research into AI, especially um, probably utilizing it quite a lot in your field. Um, the next question comes up from Anya Fouri. Uh, hi, Anya. She says, uh, how do you verify fines through AI? And um, I think, Bruce, I'm going to specifically ask is how do we verify scientific fines within ast astronomy uh, using our AI? Absolutely. Well, maybe it's a good place to start by thinking about how we do that it, just without AI, just as humans. So, for example, like, let's imagine, um, uh, let's go back to this, uh, you know, so we know that the universe is made up of stuff that we don't know what it is. So I myself have come up with theories about what it might be. And I'll go, hey, I think it's, I think it's uh, the universe is made of dark cheese. And then I try and tell my fellow scientists about it. And I say, I think it's made of dark cheese. And they say, well, I think that's stupid. Or they might, or they may say, yeah, that's actually a really interesting idea. How do I get them to think it's an interesting idea? By using the scientific method. I'll say, well, if the universe was made of dark cheese, it would do this and this and this. And that's what we actually see in the universe. So I'd make predictions for my theory. And then other people might say, oh yeah, that's actually really beautiful or exciting or interesting. And then they might go and do an experiment. So for example, um, I mentioned this uh, thing about black holes and the Big Bang. You know, those were predictions from the 1960s. Roger Penrose and uh, Stephen Hawking predicted that there must be black holes um, in the 60s. They didn't get the Nobel Prize. Nobody got the Nobel Prize. It's now 60 years later that uh, Roger Penrose gets the Nobel Prize because now we've done enough observations. We've actually seen seen black hole at the center of our galaxy it's a, so the evidence slowly mounts up layer by layer until it's really convincing and then we convince each other that it's it's worthwhile so i suspect that what will happen is that in the first phase ai might say to me maybe i'm running an ai system it says bruce when i look at the data i i think that maybe it could be made of cheese dark cheese right so i say to the computer well, why do you think that? And it says, well, for reasons A, B, C, and D. And so I go, wow, that's actually really interesting. So then I go and write a paper stealing the, the credit from the AI. <laughs> and then I try and convince my fellow scientists uh, in the same way. Um, and so the, I think at the first phase, at least, the scientific process will be more or less untouched. It's just that I will be using AI to augment my own capabilities. Um, further down the line, you could imagine AI systems that pub publish their own work without a human being involved. Um, we have systems like that at a very simple level, which just say, oh, last night something changed over there. Some new object uh, appeared, um, you might be interested in. So it's a very basic level. So I think 30, 40 years from now, there may be AI systems that are publishing their own and publicizing their own work without a human being involved. A bit like what's happening now with um, AI and, and writing blog posts. You know, you can get an AI to write a blog post for you and no humans involved in that necessarily. In 20, 30, 40 years, that may be true of papers as well. And even more sinister slash interesting, you may have AI systems communicating directly with each other, sharing knowledge with each other in a way that humans cannot understand, just because our brains are quite limited. That perhaps will be the, the most dystopian. So they may have breakthroughs that they cannot actually explain to us because we're too stupid um, 
So that would be a bit um, sad, but may well happen. That's actually a nice way of putting it, actually. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the thing is, right, we, we, we have a capacity at which we max out, max out and, and, and um, you know, when it comes to, when it comes, I mean, you, you said that if you pick up your cell phone and you're using social media, each one in competition about how long they can keep you the longest on your phone. And most people will never actually know that that's what they're doing, the feed that's coming to you has uh, sort of been uh, cut, you know, has been conditioned in such a way that it interests you, right? And it's specific to you and you can stay on for hours on social media, not understanding the, as we said, the algorithms behind all of this. Kevin Rule has, has, has two questions. So he says, um, first, have you your own theory on dark matter? And secondly, for a bit of fun, what are the chances of a Skynet like AI uprising? Yeah, so maybe in terms of dark matter, um, the the one the one theory. So there are two types. We know that there's dark matter, which acts like normal gravity. Um, it's just that we can't see it. And then there's dark energy, which is the thing that's responsible for the acceleration of the universe, and that's like anti gravity. So you got these two mysterious dark dark entities that we don't understand. And so I worked for a bit on trying to combine them into a single, um, a single entity. Um, I don't think that there is any good uh, observational evidence for it. So, I, you know, I don't think it's still a possibility, but I would, uh, you know, I would certainly not say that, um, yeah, I, th I would say we still really don't understand what the universe is made of at all. Um, so, yeah, in terms of um, Skynet and, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think it's a real issue, right? I mean, the problem is, you know, computers currently are, are much less intelligent than we are. They've got a, a long way to go. But the problem is when they reach us, they won't be coasting. They'll be going up like a rocket, right? So, you know, it'll, if they're as intelligent as we are today, then tomorrow they'll be 20% smarter. And the day after that, 20% smarter than that. And so within a month, they'll be 10 times smarter than we are. So I think it's very difficult to imagine a scenario where they're roughly the same intelligence as us. I think that will, there basically won't be any, that, that won't happen or will last for a very short time. So we'll be in either one of two states, either we're smarter than they are or they're smarter than we are. And the transition will happen very quickly when it does happen. And that, that's a huge challenge to us, right? Because we, you know, we are not very good at self-organizing as groups. Humans are incredibly robust, right? If you think about it, unlike all the other humanoid, like Denisovans and the Neanderthals, you know, there were several humanoid-like uh, species. They all died out. Humans survived somehow. So we're very good at surviving but we are creating an environment for these computers where they don't need to survive. We look after their need for food, shelter, et cetera. We're creating this nest for them. So they can just focus 100% on scaling and getting smarter. And that may turn out to be a really bad idea. You know, in 100 years time, we may regret that, but it's sort of inevitable at this point because capitalism uh, will ensure that uh, the survival will, the fittest will survive. Yeah, that's definitely, and I think that's the, that's one of the concerns, the biggest concerns when it comes to AI. I mean, we have some of the, the more, you know, current, current aspects, such as artificial intelligence, the fourth industrial revolution, job losses, and how it's going to replace the future. But I think coupled with that is, um, the, the dark side of AI and exactly how it's going to mold into the future. I mean, today we can look at, at nuclear warfare and countries threatening each other with nuclear warfare and AI would be the same. I mean, anything Absolutely. can be used, anything can be used. Um, so just before we end off, thank you, Bruce. This has been a fantastic session, an absolutely fantastic session. And so many of us 
um, you know, from our, our various perspectives are really, really excited about what the future is going to hold and how we're going to utilize AI um, and, you know, try and keep from going to the dark side. I think that's the important part uh, for all of us and the discoveries that are out there. And just before we leave, I think there's just a comment all the way from Vijay Kumar K in, in India, Aeronautica, and he says, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think this was a really fantastic presentation, Bruce. And um, we look forward to some of the discoveries and, and your specific journey into AI. Thank you so much, Brian. It was great chatting to you. Thanks. Thanks to everyone joining us. Please join us again this evening with Prof. Uh, Sarah Seeger. Um, it's a fantastic uh, lecture to join us for, and we'll see you at 1800 this evening. Cheers.